So uh, my name is Robert Brinkman, and I'm with IBM, and I'm going to talk about blockchain, in particular Hyperledger. I'll talk about positioning the technology, where are people using it, talk about use cases, and then um, what I want to go into is the internals, so you understand how it works. And then I'll talk about my kind of my day job, which is I'm building a cloud service for blockchain. And then uh, I'll talk about how to get started, how our clients are moving, progressing down this path, okay? So, um, sound good? Yeah. If you have questions, just throw them out. Hopefully I'll get the page down. No. So we'll skip this part. Okay, so current state. So let me talk about where you're going to use this. Today, what we've all been doing is if you work inside of enterprises or industry or government, we've been building our own systems, right? Enterprise class systems, run our business, get the operational efficiency, enable you to go after new markets, all that stuff. You've been doing that. Your partner's been doing that, his partner's doing it, et cetera. And then what we've done is we've connected these systems together, extranets, forever, right? To, and if you take a bank every night, you know, you run batch. And what does batch do? Sends a bunch of files over, gets a bunch of files back. You process your system of record, right? And you do this every night. And our view is that's inefficient and it's costly, and it's error prone, okay? That's where blockchain is being targeted, is to fix this problem between enterprises, okay? So blockchain is gonna be a permissioned network, a database, really, that we're gonna stick here, we're gonna move our systems of record, or portions of our systems records, not all your systems of record, but that really important data that you have today on your enterprise systems or in your enterprise, and we're gonna pick up some of that and we're gonna put them into these networks. And we're gonna expose that information so that we can provide efficiencies and new ways of doing things. Okay, so if you're, if you're familiar with enterprise systems and you do transaction processing, right? This is just transaction processes for business networks. That's what blockchain, that's what IBM is focused on, is how do we increase the efficiency, the competitive advantage of your business by doing transaction processing in the network, okay? And it eliminates all that stuff that you do at night or a lot of the stuff that you'll do at night, okay? That's the, the use case. So if you look at kind of a this journey, right? Most of my clients are all on this journey to become a digital enterprise, right? So here's my enterprise systems that sit in the middle. And a lot of the conversations I've heard today is out here on this whole API, microservices, right? Because what you're trying to do is you're trying to take these systems and enable you to deliver them to your digital channels, right? Those mobile devices, that's the digital channel, okay? There is no other digital channel. Well, maybe a browser. <laughs> but come on, the focus is on those devices, okay? And achieving efficiencies. Blockchain is this way. How do you create digital products that are more interesting to deliver to your user? So let's say you're a bank, right? Every bank has got a, a, a mobile app, right? You all do, every one of you do, right, if you're a bank. Well, how do you, what's the biggest problem with the bank? When I was a kid, you walked into a bank and that was your bank that kind of was, it was there, right? It was kind of down the street. Millennials, they, they pull up an app and they will change a bank by moving that to delete and pulling down another one. So how do you create stickiness? You have to provide more compelling types of applications to them, more compelling types of services. So how does blockchain enable that? Let's say you want to buy a car. 
I go to my dealer, I want to buy the car. We're doing transaction processing. Not look at the prices, not look at colors and stuff like that. I want to buy it. So I scrape my phone and I take that VIN number. What a bank can do is I can take that, register it with the DMV, register it with their insurance company, register it with the car company, because now I have access to all that information and I can create a more interesting product to that client out here, right? So when that person goes to buy a house, to open up a 529, open up an IRA, open up 401k, whatever, they might look at that bank because I've created some stickiness between me because I've created this more interesting digital experience. And if you're a bank, this is a good thing because banks are about making money Right? And how do you make money? Reduce risk? Because they see that asset, they know, does that person keep insurance on that asset? Do they maintain that asset? Right? It gives them a lot more visibility into it. And that's what you'll hear about blockchain, is transparency. That is like the number one term that you'll hear in blockchain, is how do we create transparency? So let me talk about what IBM Storm with blockchain. Uh, in particular, Hyperledger, and then I'll go through some use cases. So, um, blockchain's been around for about eight years, nine years, and the biggest use case out there today is Bitcoin. Okay? So, it's kind of proved out the technology. What we looked at when we looked at that technology is we said we want to apply this to enterprises, to governments, etc. So we made three decisions. One was we open sourced it. So all the work that we do, all the work that we develop on Hyperledger, we put it up on GitHub. You can download it today and do whatever you want with it. Okay. Second thing that we did is we made it asset agnostic. Like when I was just talking about a car, right? The VIN number, that's the asset. Most implementations of blockchain strictly are around currency, right? We see a lot more than just currency. So if you want to put a mortgage there, you want to put a car there, you want to put your digital identity there, you want to put your vote there, you want to put whatever type of thing that has value on a network, that asset, you can put it on Hyperledger. And then the third thing is we made it a permission network. So by being a permission network, that says the members, the people that transact on that network are known. And because they are known, we eliminate this whole concept called mining. So if you study Bitcoin, the reason it can't exceed the transaction rates is because of mining, right? And there are data centers. There's a 40 megawatt data, 40 megawatts. I mean, if you're a data center guy, and most data centers are like two or three, right? 40, and it only does 4% of the mining for Bitcoin, right? So there's no mining. So that's a huge amount of compute we just take out of the story by making it permission and making people aware of what is uh, that you can transact on this network, okay? So those were the three things. Okay. So these are a bunch of use cases. Um, we've done over 400 projects with different clients. A lot of them are consortiums that we do them with, and the whole intent is to prove out the technology. Um, some of the ones are like a lot around trade finance. In fact, the first one I did with was HSBC and Bank of America on letters of credit. A letter of credit is a legal document. It goes back and forth. People work on it a lot. They want a constant view of it. It was enabled them to simplify it. But you'll see other consortiums built around trade finance but then if you couple it with some of the supply chain, like what we're doing with Maersk, some of the food safety, which is where do you use your food, you'll see there's a lot of logistics type of activity, whether it's from a financial perspective or whether it's from the shippers and the suppliers and those type of things. We have projects going on with like the Port of Singapore, Port of Dubai, because then you start looking at customs and you look at that whole supply chain and how do you take multiple enterprises and have them have that visibility, that transparency into that shipment, okay? Some of the other ones, um, this was uh, early one I did was with this 
firm called Northern Trust in, uh, in, in London. They are a uh, equity firm. They do for high net worth individuals for private equity. So you have investors, you have the things they're investing in, you have regulators because once you get into some of those types of applications there's a lot of tax implications. So regulators want that visibility. And if you ever listen to the Northern Trust guys, they'll talk about transparency. All those participants can see those transactions, they can see what's going on and their intent is to reduce their costs, right? To build a more efficient way to do investments. Um, let's see, Everledger, they track diamonds. So in the 90s you have these conflict diamonds. So there were some laws put in place to stop blood diamonds from, you know, funding wars. So they track over a million diamonds on their ledger. They're doing art now. Um, these guys, I think, are really interesting. SecureKey. They're a Canadian firm. They have a partnership with the six largest banks in Canada. And what they're doing is um, they're building an identity network, right? Identity theft's a huge problem. So by using your banking credentials, right, your banking user ID and password, they give you access to other web services. So people can build their applications on top of their identity management. And one of their things is like, you give away too much information today. Like if someone asks you, you go into the bar and they want your ID, right? Happens all the time, it happens to me like every time, right? <laughs> what do you do? You give them your ID, they got your number uh, for, for your driver's license, they have your address. They have, and all you want to do is give them your date of birth, right? So those are the types of things that we want to do. And if you look at some of these other ones around know your customer, every bank in the world has to do know your customer, right? That says, if I'm going to transact with you, I have to know what are you doing with your money because of anti-money laundering and all that kind of stuff. So lots of use cases, lots of different assets. But the, what I will fundamentally say is, when it comes to these projects, there's four common things. There has to be a transactional process around an asset, number one. If you don't have that, blockchain ain't the right technology. Go look at something else. Second is you want network effect. If you can grow your consortium of users to get more people to adopt it, right, you want to grow that. That's why when we talk about cloud delivery, that will be the mechanism we use to deliver blockchain. That will be the primary mechanism is via the cloud. The third thing is you have to have, we call it founder-led. You have to have a visionary. You have to have somebody that starts the network and says, I have the vision of where I want this thing to go, and then they provide that kind of that driving force to build up members. So you have to have that founder. And then the last thing, like any good thing, you gotta have some kind of business case that says, you know, how do you monetize this thing? How do you create value? And I've worked with a lot of startups. There are a lot of startups looking at this technology. I mean, I just spent the weekend in New York with 150 people, all these little guys doing startups, all looking at this because they're all looking to disrupt somebody's business using these types of technologies. Okay, so those are some use cases. Uh, I'm gonna go through some technical detail on how this thing works, okay? So there will, there will be multiple networks, right? A network is a consortium of users. There's gonna be hundreds if not thousands of these networks. So that's number one. Second thing is Fabric is the software implementation. Hyperledger is the Fabric, but there's other, Ethereum, Bitcoin, uh, Ripple, Corda, those things. And the third thing is cloud, because most of these things are gonna be delivered to the cloud so you as an enterprise or a bank or whatever, you're gonna evolve to multiple networks. That's number one. Second thing is how it works. So let's say we have a fabric, and this is a distributive database technology where you're doing transaction processing, right? So I'll talk about the insides. But on the outside, you talk to it, you have an application that runs an SDK, right? Software Development Kit and it talks to the fabric via an API. So everything is just an API call. It uses TLS sessions, so if you're familiar with security, it uses those secure connections. So when this application, when that SDK talks to this fabric, 
it's going to talk to a, 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 a server there and it's going to execute a piece of code that's called chain code. Some people will call it a smart contract, but that smart contract runs against the database. And what will happen is that application proposes a, a transaction to the network. The network endorses it and says, okay, you can do it. And then it sends it off to another piece of another place where it will order it and go through what's called consensus. And consensus is the process where the machines inside of this network agree to do that transaction. Okay? And then once it's once it commits a transaction, all the nodes in here will update their database. Okay, and I'll go through a little more detail. That's the concept, pretty basic concept, okay? Now, what is a blockchain, okay? So you have blocks of transactions, right? Transaction processing, if you've done transaction processing, you create logs. Blockchain is just the log of transactions. Every one is digitally signed. So every transaction is digitally signed by who did it, and then they're put together over some period of time, defined by your network into what's called a block. And then each block is connected to each other through cryptographic hash. So you hash this thing, you create it, and put it into the next block. And that creates the chain so that someone can insert a block into your chain, right? So that's what how what someone would try to infiltrate your network, right? Is insert bogus transactions. By doing this, and these are 32 byte hashes, so it takes about a billion computers eight months to crack this thing, right? So you're not going to crack this thing, right? But that's blockchain. That's the result. So the blockchain is actually a transaction log. It's a historical remnant of what is executed on the network. Okay. So, so we have our applications, right? And these are all different business, you know, members in the network all talking to this network. Inside the network there are three things. Okay? The first thing is there's a thing called a peer. A peer is where you run your blockchain uh, co chain code. Okay? That's where you run your code. That's where you hold your database. Okay? So those are peers. There's going to be lots of peers. There's going to be a peer for everybody that is a member of that network. Okay? Second thing is uh, what's called an ordering service. Ordering service is what keeps all these peers aligned, okay? It's where you do your consensus. It's what says, how do I make sure that all the peers are exactly the same and that I don't get what's called a double spend? A double spend, you would never do this, but <laughs> let's say you had $1,000 and you said, I'm going to give everybody here $1,000 and I'll be all out of debt, right? If you didn't have a method to see you do two spends, then you could get away with that. That's what ordering does, is it stops that capability, right? So if you run us today, if you run an enterprise system, like a big Z box and you have DB2, we do what's called record level locking. We lock a record so only one person does a transaction. Same concept, but we have a distributed database all around the world, okay? And then the third thing is membership services. This is where you get your digital certificates. This is where you define who's a member of the network. This is how you control it. Those are the only components inside of a network. Uh, I won't go through that. Okay. We're, right now we're on version 1.0 of the fabric. came out in July. We'll see one to one maybe in December or January. Two new things came out with it. One is the concept of channels. In a, in a hyperledger network, there is not one big ledger that everybody sees. You can't run a business that way. Okay? So there are concepts of channels. That enables me to have bilateral agreements so that you two guys can have an agreement and you guys can have an agreement and you guys can have an agreement, but it can be all exposed and brought up to everybody, right? That's how you conduct business, right? So that if I have Walmart, Target, Amazon all on the same network, which they will be all on the same network, they can't see what's going on inside, right? It's kind of like how the stock market works today, right? You can do transactions 
but everybody can see the result, but they can't see what the individual transactions are. So that was the first thing. So that came driven by a bunch of client requirements. And the second thing is what's called pluggable consensus. It just gives you the ability to how you get people to agree things to differ, okay? I'll just leave it as that. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's open and if you have some great vision of what consensus should, could be, you can write it up and you can submit it and you can get people to build it because we're talking about a technology that is open sourced, very much like the internet, open sourced and people can expand on it. Okay. This will be my difficult, <laughs> most difficult thing, but this will tell you how it works, right? The key thing is how do you create a transaction, right? So here's the fabric. We have three things, membership services, peers, and nodes. And this is another peer, another company. Here's your company, your peer. Your application talks to it. First thing that happens is this application some proposes a transaction. It goes to the peer, runs your chain code against your ledger, which is held in an in-memory database called LevelDB, moving the couch DB. And it comes back and says, okay, I'm gonna, you can do that transaction. And then it sends it to the ordering service, it schedules it. The ordering services spits out blocks that has those transactions. They come back to all the peers and the peer looks to execute that. It looks at the, it looks at the database and it looks for a change in where that database was done. That's called a read set. It looks at that read set and it says, has that block of data in my database changed? If it hasn't changed, it will commit the transaction and execute. If it has changed and you try to do your little double spin, right? What it will do, it will, it will invalidate it and will not commit that transaction. And that's how you get transaction integrity across this entire network, right? Because these peers, they can be located anywhere in the world. I mean, that's the advantage of these networks. These things are distributed. They can be anywhere. They can be in the cloud. They can be on your premise. They can be wherever you want to put a peer, right? So this gives us the ability to control that transactional process and make sure we don't do double spends. The other thing that's going on is we'll put some SOR integration because you have existing SOR applications. So if you're familiar with ZOS Connect today, ZOS Connect runs on a mainframe and lets you do API calls, run JSON code, talk to the mainframe. We'll, we're turning that around so that you can take your CICS and IMS applications and do API calls out to the fabric. So that's the first thing we'll do. Second thing we'll do is we'll put an event manager in here. Because you have transactions that are happening on your peer, but you don't know about it, right? They're happening to your database, but you you're not going to sit there and pull it because that will be really expensive. So we'll put an event monitor in there that says something has changed. I'll generate an event to you. Okay. And then the second thing we're working on is putting analytics inside the fabric because we don't want to take the data out of the fabric. We've done that forever, right? Everybody takes these big mainframes and every night they unload them into their data warehouses and they do their analytics. We want to create a foundation of two so that you can do the analytics right inside of the fabric. Okay? You get it? You all understand how this works now? Okay. It's, it's really not that complicated. Okay. So let's talk about getting started and then we'll go have a drink. Um, so I work for IBM and I work in a part of IBM called Client Centers, and we host our clients. If you've ever been to Poughkeepsie or Austin or Montpelier or Bubligan or any of our um, client centers, we, we, we do work there and we do a lot of the, the process that we've developed is start with our clients, let's learn about the technology. Second thing is where we get more detailed, where we kind of have an IT track so I, I have a bunch of guys from a consulting firm in Poughkeepsie this week, and they're all doing hands-on on how to program this thing, okay? How to generate chain code, how to use the fabric composer, how to configure it, all that type of stuff, IT architectural type of work. 
And then we have what's called use case exploration, which is more for the business, where we have a workshop, and I've done them, they're a couple hours or they're a couple days, and it goes through your use case, what you're trying to do from a business perspective, because I don't want an IT guy, I want the business guy, because they're the ones that are driving <clears throat> these things, and it focuses on the use case. And then our intent is to very quickly go into what's called a garage. These are agile software developing environments. We have them in San Francisco and New York. And they develop an application in two to six weeks. So they spend a few days, they do these design sessions, they figure out all these personas, all that kind of stuff, and then they develop code. And the whole intent of that is to come out with something that you can take to your executives, or the executives can look at it and they can say, this looks like an interesting technology, and you haven't sat and spent nine months digging through it, looking at it, right? Very quick. And then where we're focusing a lot now is into scale, right? That says, okay, I'm coming out of this, and I want to make it production, okay? So that's where I spend my time. Uh, like I said, I'm building our cloud service. Our cloud service is based on IBM Z, that big Z processor, that thing there, that I'm installing in cloud data centers uh, globally. I have like six or seven of them installed now. And it's where we run our service out of. Because remember, you are building consortiums of multiple companies. Having that in the cloud is where you're going to start. OK? That's where most of our clients want to be. So we chose the Z for really three reasons. Security, security, and security, okay? You've seen the real estate thing, right? <laughs> location, location. To me, it's all about security. We are going to ask you to take this really important data on your system of record running in your business today and move it into the cloud. And that, for a lot of people, that's really scary, right? So how do you secure it, right? So the one thing that that box has on it is what's called a secure container. And a secure container is a, runs, this stuff runs in Linux. It's, a, it's a, the ability that I can lock out any user. There is no root access, right? And it gives us what we call the Snowden effect. So you can't take a system and admin and download all the data out of the fabric. So me, as a cloud operator, I have no access to your containers. Right? Only you, because you are a member, you're permissioned, you have access via that API. You are the only one that has access to that capability. Okay? That's the reason we did it. The second, you can talk about transactional scalability and all those other things, but that's the main reason. Cloud delivery, uh, either multi tenancy or dedicated. If you want your own dedicated private network, private would be. You know, it's hosted in the cloud, but everybody's going to VPN in. We're going to give you that, okay? Most of it today is I give you URLs, public URLs. You deploy your apps, multi-tenancy, okay? So advantages, you know, I couldn't tell you a lot of advantages, but the, it's cheaper, it's faster to deliver, and it's just an easier way to get into the business of doing blockchain, okay? Uh, this just talks about the same thing I think I already said, secure containers. We can take that box and we can partition it uh, so we can get lots of people into a single platform. Uh, so there's efficiencies of doing that. And then inside of the Z box, inside that box is a thing called a Crypto Express card. It is FIPS level 140-4 compliant, 2 compliant. But what it means is all these networks, at the heart of them, is a digital key, right? You gotta have a key to do sign these transactions. We store that key in hardware, and that hardware is tamper-proof. So if someone took the card out, and they took it somewhere in their little lab, and they tried to open it up, it would, blow, it would smoke and blow up, okay? Or if they tried to, any way to get into it, you can't break into that card. I mean, we use this. This thing is a foundation for most banks that do transaction processing, that manage your money. So a lot of this is how do you do this 
securely because it goes back to we're taking you your really important information and we want to put it in the cloud. I have to give you a platform that you're comfortable as a business guy of doing, right? So that's why we chose Z. Okay, so I got 30 seconds. <laughs> so if you're getting started, start in the cloud. We have a, a free service under Bluemix. You can do call Developer Sandbox. You can provision a Hyperledger network, take you a couple minutes, and you can start provisioning it, okay? Um, this is where you do development early learning. Then the next thing is stay in the cloud and move your production onto that platform we just talked about. Uh, and then this gets into determine access. Do you want private or dedicated? Build your membership, network effect, right? Expand your access. How do applications access the data? Because the strength of this technology is going to be on your membership, on your consortium. If you've got two people in there, it's not going to be interesting. You have hundreds, it's going to be really, really interesting, okay? Thousands more, right? And then last is move to hybrid cloud. So we will give you the ability to run this in a hybrid cloud. So if you want to have the fabric, the ordering service, membership services in the cloud, but you want peers, which is your data, sitting on your premise next to your secure behind your firewall, you can do that, okay?